Hi friends, I'm Gio, and this is Speeding, Chapter 13. Quick synopsis, Ethan and Pete are falling in love. Life still goes on though. Ethan has been called to cover for another ambulance driver, and Pete, though with Ethan's help, he has gone through some of his things. He will still be evicted by the end of August. The little noises in the background belong to my dog. She snores. Let's start with Ethan. We have got to get you a faster coffee maker, Pete said, slowly pouring the boiling water into the fresh ground coffee beans already inside the French press coffee maker. But it smells good, Roy said, rummaging through the fridge for leftovers from dinner. He was out of luck because I had already packed them in one of my lunch containers and was taking them today. I like coffee better this way. The flavor is amazing, I said, pulling the pack of biscotti from the fridge and another of the fresh formed dough balls I'd bake when I was at the 341. My boyfriend is a coffee elitist, Pete said, putting the top on the French press, then slowly pressing the insert down trapping the grounds underneath the coffee. It was a little after one in the morning. Somebody knocked. Roy, would you get the door? I said. Pete poured the coffee into a thermos and sealed it up. Roy answered the door and let Xavier in. Morning. You already know my boyfriend, Pete, and that's his brother, Roy, I said, grabbing everything I would need. How's Tia? She collapsed, and I took her to Long Ridge. I don't know what's wrong, Xavier said. His shoulders droop, and he didn't have any of the fire he had earlier today. He seemed like a deflated balloon. Do you want me to drive? I asked. A very tired Xavier eyed my apartment. Pete, Roy, my dog, and my fresh coffee. Yeah, three guys live here. So this is what 200 Things does. 201, Pete said. Ethan bought a shredder to help me with my papers. It's temporary. I don't keep papers. And once we get your place cleaned up, you can have the shredder. Or I'm donating it, I said. But it's a shredder. You'll need it, Xavier said. Except for the most current bills, three years of taxes, a will, and a couple of important papers, I don't keep any papers around, I said. Pete, you'll drop Sabretooth off with Mom at 6.30? You remember the address, right? Don't worry, Pete said, and kissed me goodbye. Both Xavier and Roy looked away. I guess they weren't accustomed to guys kissing each other. I stowed my gear in the rig, and we drove out of the parking lot with me behind the wheel. The rig was down a quarter tank, so I pulled into an all-night truck stop to top off the tank with diesel. Our little town had a contract with them. Dead Man's Butte is too small to have a municipal fuel depot, though Chief keeps bringing it up with the city council. After filling the rig, I grabbed a couple of sandwiches and went outside to meet Xavier. He hadn't left the passenger seat. I climbed in the driver's seat, gave him one of the sandwiches, and we took off. What's eating you? I asked Xavier. You wouldn't understand, Xavier said. I probably would. I'm only two years ahead of you, I said. Xavier took a big bite of the sandwich before speaking. Earlier today, me and Tia showed up at some house on the southern edge of the butte. A 15-year-old girl had jumped off the roof, thinking she would make a big splash in their pool. She missed the pool. I'm pretty sure her leg was broken, and Tia wanted to strap her to a backboard and put a collar on her. I'd gotten a splint on her leg, but the girl was in pain. Tia was in contact with Longridge the entire time, and Dr. Anderson had ER2 prepped and ready. The girl's dad came home and yelled and screamed and swore at us, told us how expensive an ambulance was, how we were overpaid, and he wasn't going to pay for it. He declined transport. His daughter was obviously in pain, and Tia thought she might have neck or spinal damage, and the girl needed help. But her dad wouldn't let us take her. His wife argued with him, but he screamed at us to get off his property. I've never been yelled at like that before. Did Tia have him sign a refusal of service? I asked. 
She tried, but he wouldn't stop screaming. I signed as witness, and then Officer Gillespie signed as well. I don't know if the girl made it to the hospital or what happened, Xavier said, fidgeting with his seatbelt. I hate domestic drama, I said. We didn't speak until we almost got back to the 341. I've never had anybody hate me like that before. Did you ever want to quit? Xavier said, but very softly. Almost every day for my first six months. Your rookie year is hard. Even though we're helping people all day long, very few of them say, thank you, I said. You eventually get used to the crazy schedule, and the sudden change from complete calm to complete chaos becomes normal. But there's no call for people acting rude. Sometimes I think it's their fear leaking out. I pulled into the 341 in silence. The paramedic truck, the pumper truck, and the ladder truck were already here. A quiet night. I bet that wouldn't last. Xavier joined the guys in the bunk room, and I hid the biscotti in the back of the fridge so Dietrich wouldn't find it, and tucked the bread dough in front of it. Later, once B shift had started, I'd bake hamburger buns. Even though it was well after one, Chief was back in his office. I knocked and stepped in. Any word on Tia? Emergency appendectomy. She must have been feeling something these last couple of days and ignored it, Chief said, shuffling some papers. Grab a spot in the bunk room, and if you're lucky, you can get paid to sleep. When has that ever happened, I said. Chief grunted. The bunk room was a dimly lit room with 16 bunks, 11 of which were filled. The 341 didn't have the cliché fireman's pole to slide down because everything here was on the same level. This was a refurbished elementary school, and the 341 shared it with the police department. The bunk room had three large doors. One led into the hall, one led into the unisex bathroom, the other led to the trucks and rigs. Running to the rigs was a lot faster than sliding down a pole anyway. A lot of guys did the Hollywood thing and stripped down to A-shirts and boxers, while some were more modest and wore athletic shorts and t-shirts. Some of us napped in our clothes. The alarm woke us about four. 341, code one, apartment complex on fire, police en route, fire assistance required, paramedics required, ambulance required. Dispatch, this is Alvers of 341, code one acknowledged, Chief said into his radio and looked at his screen. Hurry it up, people. We don't want to be late to this party. 342 has been invited as well. We haven't had a two alarm for a year or more, Steph said pulling the suspenders of her turnout pants over her shoulders. Three alarm. They're pulling a unit from Vegas. The fire has jumped, Chief yelled. In seconds, the firefighters were dressed in their turnout gear, hopped into their boots, and ran to their trucks. They'd stitch up their boots and round. Xavier still sat on his bunk. His eyes were wide, and his skin had gone pale. Xavier fumbled for his shoes and looked at me his first big party since he signed on. Stage fright. First big fire is always the worst. I'll drive, I said, and grabbed his shoes. I pulled him to the rig and opened the door for him. I did with him what Tia had done for me my first year. Let's see how well you studied the map. Tell me what's in every cupboard. He did. Tia had drilled me like this on every mission. Her sneaky trick had really been to calm me down. Xavier didn't even have his seatbelt on when I pulled out of the station. Priority 1. Full SNL. Dispatch. This is Ethan responding to the code 1. Acknowledged, Dispatch said. Xavier, read me what's on the screen, I ordered. Xavier didn't move and hadn't spoken. Get your seatbelt on, I ordered. Xavier fumbled for his seatbelt. Xavier, focus and read the screen, I ordered again. Xavier looked at our screen and frowned. Montmartre Apartments. Building 10 is in flames and Building 9 has caught fire too. Multiple 911 calls. Unknown casualties, unknown injured, unknown cause. What would make it spread like that? Good. Xavier started to function again. Fire could have followed the gas lines, or everybody was asleep and didn't notice until it was too late, or one of the apartments stored something combustible and it exploded and got the other building, I said. There's no point guessing. We won't know anything until they investigate, and that won't happen until after the fire's out. Right. What do we do? Xavier asked. As soon as we're parked, 
Open the outdoor rear cupboard on the passenger side and get out our turnout gear, I said. Turnout gear? We don't go into fires. We're ambulance drivers, Xavier shouted, his voice rising a little. We're here to save lives. In cases like this, the chief, Steph, and guys focus on fighting the fire. We focus on medical. Often, the lines blur. We do what is needed, I said. Even though we left the station a little later, we still beat the pumper and the ladder, but not the paramedics. The rig for the 342 arrived a minute after we did, followed by its paramedics and its pumper. Building 10 was located deep inside the complex, with Building 9 next to it. The pumper trucks had an easier time navigating between the buildings and parking lots, but the ladder truck was longer. The parking in the complex was not fire-friendly. The problem of early mornings at an apartment complex? Every parking stall, from covered stalls to free zones, was filled. Whoever drove would have a hard time backing out. The two pumpers and the ladder got close to the buildings and found the nearest fire hydrants. Dietrich and one of the guys ran hoses to the hydrant, while another guy settled the ladder truck on the ground and dropped the outrigger stabilizers. Others began stretching out the hoses, while another person stood at the control panel on the side of the pumper and readied it for the sudden pressure. The Montmartre Apartments was a large complex, 22 buildings containing 12 apartments each, clustered around a swimming pool, a laundry room, a clubhouse, and a managerial office. Both us, the paramedics, and the rig for the 342 parked near each other, backing up to a pet lawn, or whatever it was, and in a second we were all wearing our turnout gear. That's the oversized fireproof pants with suspenders, the oversized fireproof jacket, fireproof boots, fireproof gloves, and even the fireproof hat, though for emergency treatment we usually don't wear the gloves. Xavier turned gray with each piece of the turnout gear he put on. The safe zone is across the street. Send anyone you find over there, an officer yelled and pointed to the crowd. Fifty people were there already. The irony? That's how Sean and Thad met. 341, we'll make this our triage. A man, I guess he was the senior partner for the 342, said. You're Ethan. We'll be working together at the 343. I'm Carlson. Chief has me scheduled for C-shift. My partner's Garrett. Chief wants me on A-shift at 343, and this is Xavier, I said. Carlson's eyes narrowed a little. Time to get serious, rookie. Xavier nodded and fumbled the zipper on his coat. Have the cops set up the cones and let's pool our water, I said. We gathered what we had. Four cases of twelve bottles of water. Twenty-four guys, plus cops, plus victims. That's not enough, one of the paramedics said. Xavier had dressed in his turnout gear by now, but didn't say anything. Dispatch, this is Ethan. We're going to need a lot of drinking water, I said into my radio. Understood, Dispatch said. We didn't have time to finish setting up the triage zone. Chief called on the radio. Ethan, Xavier, Carlson, Garrett, hustle your butts. We have injured. I grabbed one end of the stretcher and started running. Xavier did not move. His eyes had gone wide and he gulped his breath. Move it, Xavier. Grab the stretcher, I yelled. Xavier took the back. I led. Flame sprattered from the top of Building 10, and the broken windows on the top floor flickered with inner firelight. The hoses were hooked up and filled. The ladder truck, with two guys adjusting a hose into the holder, was lifting its ladder. Several car alarms screamed. By the pumper for the 342 stood Chief, holding a man up. Smoke smudges covered the man's body, and he was burned on most of his chest and right arm, but the burns were shiny and had bubbled. Some had split open and were leaking. His night clothes were scorched and burned. He smelled of burnt hair. Treating him this close to the fire was not an option. I did like Tia did with me. Xavier, sit, Rep, I yelled. The ladder had raised a position, and the hoses made a gigantic hissing as the water shot out. I couldn't tell who was on top of the ladder, but the two people sprayed into the upper apartments. Dozens of car alarms screamed. People wailed and moaned as they fled their units. Spotlights played across the buildings. Officers ran to each apartment and pounded on the doors. Red and blue lights flashed, making the entire parking lot a nightmare. We strapped the burned man into the stretcher and were running back to the rigs when some guy half-dressed in a navy blue business suit ran up to us. He was actually fumbling with a red tie. He had to shout so we could hear him. Move these goddamn trucks so I can get my car out. Are you injured? 
Xavier yelled. We never stopped running. No, he yelled. Join the others in the safe zone across the street, I yelled back. Do you know who I am? A state senator. Xavier and I kept running. I yelled back. This man is fighting for his life. Unless you're willing to help us save lives, your title is useless. Get out of our way and let us do our job. But you don't understand, he yelled. I have to have my car. I pointed at the man in the stretcher. Talking to you is taking away from the time I could be saving this man. If he dies because you're too focused on yourself, what does that make you? I yelled back. The state senator finally noticed the burn victim in the stretcher, and his pace slowed. We ran into triage. Gare was treating a couple of victims with oxygen and handing out water bottles. A policeman had trouble breathing, and Garrett forced him to sit down and wear an oxygen mask. We rolled our stretcher to one of the paramedics. They took one look at our patient and began to work on him. The state senator slowly walked past triage, looking at all the men and women in need of care. I yelled, Time to serve the people, Senator. Go over there and find out if anyone needs our help. Chief called again over to the radio. Second victim. Xavier and I appropriated the stretcher for the 342 and ran back to the scene. In only a few minutes, the chaos had gotten worse. Now flames were coming out of both buildings, and the area smelled like a barbecue grill on steroids. This time, a college guy held his arm and tried to keep from screaming. His burns were confined to his arm, were black and leaked pus, and I suspect were down to the muscle. He still felt pain so the nerve endings weren't burned away. We strapped him down and got out of there. The paramedics had loaded the 341 with the stretcher containing the first burnt man, and a couple of smoke inhalation patients were sitting on the bench inside. I helped the man with the burned arm into the passenger seat. Xavier, you're driving, I said, jumping into the captain's chair. I tapped the partition and yelled, locked and loaded. We took off. It was going to be crowded back here. Xavier was quiet. I needed him alert. Call it in, I yelled. Dispatch, this is Xavier of the 341. Code 1, priority 1 to Long Ridge, full SNL, he yelled as we took off. Code 1 acknowledged, Long Ridge is standing by, dispatch said. A second later, Long Ridge responded. 341, this is Dr. Swanson, doc on call. Give me some details. Xavier's no Tia, she's a demon behind the wheel. But he wasn't bad. We were at Long Ridge minutes later, and the interns and nurses helped unload our patients and transferred them to stretchers. I had a quick word with Swanson, then Xavier and I were back on the road. Xavier didn't even have time to turn the sirens off. Turnout gear is hot, and I was sweating underneath. Good thing P wasn't here. One whiff of me and he'd dump me. Firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics don't win fashion shows with disasters like this. We got back to the Montmartre apartments, just in time to see the 342 leave, full SNL. One of the paramedics was placing oxygen on one of the firefighters and passing out water bottles to a couple of others. The paramedics from both the 341 and the 342 were hovering over victims, prepping them for transport. The Butte's local news crew had showed up and were filming both the people at the safe zone and the dark apartment buildings that were still on fire. The senator had his moment to look good for the cameras. Xavier and I didn't have time to enjoy the scenery. Something popped from one of the burning buildings and burned. I bet it was a barbecue unit with a propane tank. We ran back to the pumpers and the ladders for the next patient. When we returned to triage, a couple of cars had pulled up. Lewis, Bacon, Jesse, Harry, Braddock, and Draper, and the rest of B-Shift, all in their turnout gear, were leaping out. The cavalry was here. Had it been three hours already? Xavier, I said, taking a long swig from a water bottle. You pulled it together just in time. Go home and get some sleep. Xavier gave me a tired half-smile, his face smudged and his hair sweaty, just like me. Oh my God, Ethan, bring the stretcher, Steph screamed over the radio. Building number nine seemed to hiss, then a window on the top floor shattered. Lewis and I took hold of the stretcher and ran. I finally got a break about ten in the morning, and I sat on the back of the rig sipping some water. My clothes were drenched with sweat, and I was dirty from the ambient grime in the air and every muscle ached. The job wasn't over. The fire in Building 9 was out, though, but Building 10 was a different story. Whatever they had stored in one of the apartments wouldn't go out. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my wallet. The folded paper Chief had given me was in there. 
I must be exhausted because I had the craziest, the strangest, the weirdest idea I've ever had. I chose a name at random, called them, then talked to them a moment. They referred me to a social worker who specializes with LGBTQ issues. I called the social worker because what I had in mind needed someone who knew the ins and outs of the system and set up an after-hours appointment in my apartment for Thursday, tomorrow night, at 6. We'd have dinner and a long discussion. Then I called Sean and told him. He and Thad had wanted something like this also, and Sean rapidly, ecstatically agreed before I even finished giving him the details. Tomorrow night would be a dinner party that would change our lives. I hope Pete was ready, because I wasn't sure I was. Something this important should be discussed in person. I left a message on Pete's phone. I can't believe it's happening this fast. Thursday night, 6 o'clock, our place. We're having a dinner party. I've invited a very special guest who might be able to give you your dreams. Pick me up from the 341 Thursday morning and I'll give you the details. I love you. I'd only been sitting down for 10 minutes, hadn't even finished my water bottle, when a dog barked. It was a panicky, frantic yip that somehow yelped through the chaos. The small dog was on the balcony of the second floor of one building down from Building 9. The balcony door had a doggy door that the dog must have used. The dog wore a neon green service animal vest. A small dog? Service animal? A small service dog was usually needed for comfort or dealing with anxiety. It was the kind of service dog that never left its owner. Something inside me hardened, and I donned the professional mask. Somebody had never left that building, and with the way the dog was barking, something was wrong. I bet the dog's owner was still inside. We have a situation, suspected per... I said into my radio, but I didn't get to finish. The fire that was supposed to be out in Building 9 wasn't out. Something flared on the first floor. Had somebody been storing gasoline? Get back, Bacon yelled, and the fire decided it wanted to party. It burped and roared and leaped out the remains of the patio glass double doors. Whatever it is, Ethan, handle it, Jesse yelled. Clint, get that hose over here. Investigating Building 8, I yelled. Understood, Jesse screamed. Clint, move it. Who was available? Both Draper and Braddock were helping with the burn victim. Lewis and one of the 342 paramedics were wheeling somebody into triage. Everybody else was at the fire. The 342 was getting ready to pull out. It was only me. Lopez was nearby, but he wasn't wearing fire gear. I pointed at the barking dog. Somebody's trapped. Lopez nodded, and we ran for the stairwell. Though it was an open stairwell, and this building wasn't on fire, the stairwell seemed smoky. We got to the apartment and pounded on the door. No one answered. Lopez grabbed my shoulder and pointed to the top of the stairs. Was that third floor door on fire? I wasn't going to take any chances. Jesse, the fire has jumped to building eight, and Lopez and I are rescuing somebody, I yelled. Shit, Jesse said, and started giving instructions. I didn't pay attention because I had to rescue this person. On three, I yelled. One, two, three. Lopez and I both kicked the door as hard as we could. The lock snapped, the deadbolt tore through the wood, and the door flung open. The apartment was filled with bookcases stacked with books, memorabilia, and pictures. Multiple boxes were around. I presumed were filled with more of the same. Level 2 hoarder, maybe level 3. Why do people keep so much crap? By the door was a walker with a small purse attached, set next to a small dog carrier that had the neon green label for Service Animal. That was next to a small shelf overflowing with dozens of pairs of women's shoes. This apartment wasn't as bad as Pete's place, but it was bad enough to make my skin crawl. Still, I could see the balcony. Would that be enough to keep me okay? Lopez wasn't wearing safety gear or any of the turnout gear, so I had to do this alone. The door in level 3 was on fire. This place was about to get very wet, very fast. I think an elderly woman is trapped here. I'm going to do a quick search, find whoever it is, and then exit out the balcony before the guys aim their hoses here. Have somebody ready to catch me, I yelled, and charged in. I didn't have time to freak out. I did have time to smell the smoke. 
Nobody was in the short hallway, but it was stacked with boxes. Nobody was in the dining area, but it had a rack of clothes. Nobody was in the kitchen, but the counter was covered with a microwave, a coffee maker, and a lot of dirty dishes. Nobody was in the bathroom, but the counters were covered with skincare products and soaps. There was somebody in the bedroom. A 90-year-old woman lay in a tall pillowed bed covered with some blue plaid quilt, and she snored as loud as Sabretooth. Next to the bed was a small doggy pillow, also blue plaid, with doggy dishes beside it. She didn't let the dog sleep next to her, so the little animal couldn't wake her up. On a nightstand were her hearing aids and a pair of pink rhinestone glasses. The woman hadn't heard anything. I grabbed the hearing aids and the glasses and put them in my pocket, then scooped her up, quilt and all. The woman woke immediately. She screamed and hit me with an elbow. One arm broke free of the blanket and she clawed my face. I'm trying to save your life, I shouted. She never heard me. I kicked through her mementos and pictures and crap and got out to the balcony. The little dog barked at me. I set the elderly woman down. The woman screamed and yelled, Thief! I handed her the glasses and hearing aids and wiped at the scratches on my face. The woman put her glasses on and stared about her, confused. Ethan, are you out? Jesse yelled through the radio. We're on the balcony, I yelled back. Lewis and Draper ran towards us, carrying a ladder. The woman tried to run back inside, but I held her. The building is on fire. Something else exploded in Building 9. The woman heard that, or felt it. She must have finally noticed the smoke and fires, noticed that we were dressed in our turnout gear, because she calmed down a little. At least she wasn't trying to run away. She clutched the railing as if it were the only thing keeping her from falling. She screamed, Save Mrs. Choo Choo. That must be the dog. Draper set up the ladder and Lewis climbed up. Take the dog, I yelled, and handed the little thing to Lewis. He quickly climbed down and handed the dog to Draper. Sorry about this, ma'am, I yelled, and picked her up in my arms. The woman was too feeble to use the ladder, but the water would start spraying any second. Did we have time to go back through the house? Had the fire eaten through the ceiling? I checked the ladder truck, and the ladder was almost in position to start spraying. Time to do the impossible. With one hand to stabilize her body, I pushed through the piles and mementos and boxes and books, keeping my eyes on the door. As long as I could see the door, I had a way out. Ethan, are you out? Clint yelled through the radio. My pictures, the old woman screamed. I have to have my pictures. More boxes. Something crawled on me. It's in my mind. Look at the door. Keep looking at the door. The open, broken door. My pictures, the woman screamed. We'll make it, Lewis said, behind me. He forced himself in front of me and cleared a path. I took what I assumed was a family portrait and followed Lewis. We cleared the door and Draper took the woman from me. I reached inside the door and grabbed a pair of the woman's shoes, the dog kennel, and the walker. Lewis took them from me and ran after Draper and the woman. I wasn't far behind him. Finally, I was clear of that woman's memorabilia. I took a very deep breath. Empty space at last. Clint, Ethan and the patient are out, Draper said. Make it rain. Just seconds after I left the building, the hoses began to spray. Ethan, Clint yelled through the radio, we found an idiot who didn't evacuate when they should have. Bring the stretcher. Break time was most definitely over. As Lewis and I ran with the stretcher, I couldn't help but smile. I hope Pete likes what I have to tell him. Thanks, friends, for joining me. Remember, you're beautiful. Peace.